Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, you can all access my paper. Um, I intend to use the information in that paper to give a brief overview of how we got to where we are today. Um, marketers will tell you it's this all about the story. So I want to revisit an old story. Um, if you're like me, you probably grew up believing that all of New Zealand was in bush until hardy settlers came along and hacked out farms and converted the forest to pasture. Um, this story used to be a source of pride for the whole of the country, not just farmers, but today it's just a source of guilt. Guilt at lost biodiversity, guilt at sediment running into waterways. But I think we need to take another look at the story. How accurate is it in reality? Um, fern, fern, nothing but dry, dusty fern. This was um, Colenso writing in 1841 when he was unable to find any shade on a day's walk from Teringa to Whararoa, just north of Wairoa. If we move forward 40 years and go a little south, Guthrie Smith moved on to a new station, Tutira, and he records that less than two of the 60,000 acres were in bush. Um, since the 1350s, the whole of the east coast was dominated by fern from the foothills to the sea. I need to put a caveat in here that I should have done at the beginning. Both my paper and my talk now is predominantly about East Coast hill country pastures, but I hope there'll be some take-home messages for other people. Um, so that's not the landscape that I had imagined, and I don't think it's the landscape that a lot of New Zealanders imagined was in our past. Um, it was transformed, but not by bands of axemen. It was transformed by two London Quakers, uh, William Bryant and Francis May. Um, that's an old joke, but it's true that Fern did burn magnificently. Uh, unfortunately, Fern was also very, very persistent, and um, it required more fires, more heavy set stocking, which produced more bare ground and more sediment. Um, if we move forward to after the Second World War with the advent of aerial top dressing, we were able to maintain a dense pasture sward. Fires weren't needed anymore to stop reversion, so farmers were able to put up fences without them getting burnt down. They were able to plant trees. Poplars and willows could hold the land much more successfully than fern could. And... Um, more fences meant we could hit better pasture management and a lot of those bare network of sheep tracks now grew grass and stopped sediment rushing down. Move forward to now and we've got a, a focus on regrassing and fodder cropping. We are moving back to a management regime that's going to regularly denude the hills and put holes in our beautiful dense pasture. Um, a truly persistent pasture is a, is, is a permanent pasture with a large range of species. There's a gene pool that's going to shift to sit, suit the, the conditions and there'll always be a, a species that'll move into any gap. Um, I've shown with my own example here that you can get a top financial result without fodder cropping or pasture renewal. Um, and I'm running out of time, so I better move to the end. Um, my plea is that um, we need to do more research on permanent pastures. We need to desperately digitalize a whole lot of resources that are lost to the current generation of farmers and their advisors. There's a wealth of knowledge out there. You know, if, we, if we're unsatisfied with the production from a permanent pasture, we know how to shift the management to promote the species we want. That's all there in the literature. And also, if we had a more accurate history, we'd have a better story to tell. Thank you.